And I believe it's working. Can you see my screen? Tips and tricks for trading gold and Forex. If you can, please just say yes into the chat box. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to talk you through some of the big fundamental stories and what we're looking at for the October, for the fourth quarter, um, how to position yourself properly, how to look at trades and, you know, with along with it, tips and tricks for trading gold and Forex. So let's go ahead and get started. So today, the focus is going to be our best strategies for trading the New York and Asia session. But before we um, talk about trading strategies, I think it's really important to talk about, you know, what's going on in the markets, because, you know, what I often do, you know, with, um, you know, our members and also on Twitter and YouTube is I put, I hope to put the fun and fundamentals and I hope to demystify, you know, some of, you know, what's the, is happening in the world and help you understand how to translate that into trading opportunities. So, you know, it's almost hard to remember that the first half of 2023 was marked by panic. We had the European energy crisis, the U.S. bank crisis. I mean, if you remember, some banks went belly up and there was a lot of fear that this would have a um, trickle through effect to the rest of the other banks in the economy. But, you know, the Treasury the, you know, came out or the U.S. government came out, you know, basically um, insured of all those deposits and put that in everyone's past memory. So it's almost um, it's almost hard to remember that in March we were mired in a banking crisis. But, you know, the banking crisis isn't over. Um, it's not in the same shape or form as it was in the first half of 2023. But it's something that is still a very big concern for a lot of people who are watching how the U.S. economy and by extension, the global economy is um, doing. So uh, I'm sorry, let me um, just... Uh, mute my discord here otherwise i'm going to get a million different chats from my buddy boris um so i'm going to mute him for three hours he's not going to like that but uh, that's what's going to happen so the first half of 2023 marked by panic we also had central banks engaged in an aggressive interest rate tightening cycle and you know this tightening cycle led to interest rate hikes by pretty much all of the major central banks led to um, mortgage, borrowing costs, mortgage rates skyrocketing. For those of you that are um, uh, in the US, you know, you may know that mortgage rates are well above 7% now, and everyone's looking at the possibility of US yields hitting 5%, which uh, would be big trouble for um, anyone with any type of a loan. So this was the first half of 2023. Now, as we enter the fourth quarter, which, of course, will kind of carry over into um, the, the beginning, the first quarter of 2024, I think the better way to say is what's to expect over the next six months. And what to expect over the next six months is a couple of things. Number one, slower global growth. One of the big stories and the reason why the U.S. dollar has been so strong um, for the better part of the last few months is because, you know, number one, um, the Federal Reserve um, was, you know, raising interest rates, you know, the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates aggressively and talking about more to come. But number two, there was been a huge divergence in um, global growth, where for a very long period, you saw um, weaker Eurozone, UK data, and the US kept it surprising to the upside with, with, you know, good labor market numbers, good inflation data. And, you know, Everyone's talking about how the labor market um, is, is, is or the Federal Reserve is talking about how the labor market remains very healthy. So the upside surprises, the positive surprises that we were getting in U.S. Um, data was driving the U.S. dollar higher. So you've got that and you've got the um, fact that the Federal Reserve um, was, you know, one of the more aggressive central banks and still talking about the possibility of raising interest rates. And then you also have um, the dollar catching a bit of a safe haven bid as some of the problems around the world increase the attractiveness of the U.S. dollar. Some of the problems around the world being like the quasi implosion, in the Chinese property market and economy. They've been hiding the numbers, so we haven't seen all of it. But the um, slowdown that we were seeing or we're still seeing in the Asia Pacific region um, is making 
the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy more attractive. But in the next six months, Q4, Q1, what you're going to see is what I call the convergence in growth, um, where we see slower globally, everyone's going to slow. But the U.S. is no longer going to be able to see those extreme positive upside surprises. Um, I think that you're going to see, you know, more um, pockets of weakness. And the U.S. economy is going to slow more materially, especially with um, a lot of threats to consumer spending that, you know, is manif uh, manifesting itself beginning in October. You know, for example, um, student loan payments, which, you know, have been frozen for the past three years, meaning that if you had a student loan, you didn't need to pay anything for the past three years, that those payments need to start being made this month. So anyone with a student loan now sees their pocketbooks pinched as a result. And then also we have higher energy costs, um, higher oil prices, higher going into the um, winter season when everyone's using more um, energy to heat their homes. So that is also going to bite into the pockets books of consumers. And then on top of that, you have a lot of um, strikes that are happening, auto worker strike. Um, there's some other strike, 75,000 workers. I saw a headline for, I'm sure you know, I for some reason it just slipped my mind. But the numbers are adding up. And you still also have the actor strike in Hollywood, which not only affects the actors, but also affects all the below the line um, industry, like um, catering companies, makeup artists, you know, everything else. So overall, um, you know, we are seeing a situation where um, we are looking at, we will most likely look at U.S. growth converging to the rest of the world's growth in the form of a slowdown. Now, look, it still looks like it's going to be a soft landing because, you know, tomorrow we have non-farm payrolls in the U.S. And I was just talking to our BK members um, about what we expect for non-farm payrolls. And when we look at non-farm payrolls, we all always like to dissect what I call the leading indicators for non-farm payrolls. And I think, you know, maybe um, it'd be a good opportunity. I'm just going to share uh, my screen just to show you um, what I have, um, what we listed out this morning. It'll be easier for you to run down with me here. Um, okay, here we go. Um, let me see if you see my Discord screen right now. Um, yes, you do. Okay, so we ran down the arguments in favor of stronger and weaker non-farm payrolls. And you can see the arguments, first of all, first glance, four to four, pretty much even where, you know, the arguments in favor of non-farm payrolls are like, you know, we have a very low four-week moving average of jobless claims. They're extremely low. And we also have continuing claims dropping over the past month. We also have Challenger, um, which produces a layoff report, reporting about half the amount of, of layoffs this month than last month. And then we had a rise in the employment component of ISM manufacturing. In terms of um, the arguments in favor of weaker payrolls, both of the confidence measures, University of Michigan and the Conference Board weekend, the most important leading indicator for non-farm payrolls is the ISM service report, and that also um, weakened. And then, of course, we had that um, very weak ADP number yesterday, which triggered the sell-off in um, the U.S. dollar and U.S. yields. So, you know, we so tomorrow's report um, is a tough call. I mean, at that you know, there's arguments in favor of stronger payrolls. There's arguments in favor of weaker payrolls. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what you're going to see is that you know, while we may see some um, deterioration in the overall report, uh, and the number of jobs um, produced in uh, in September will be fewer than the number of jobs produced in August, um, the unemployment rate is expected to improve, and average hourly earnings are expected to improve. So, all in, the question that everyone's um, facing tomorrow is, um, will it be? good enough for the Fed to proceed with a rate hike, another rate hike. And I think that it's not going to um, uh, cast too much doubt on where the Federal Reserve stands right now. So that is why this overall, the numbers just show that the soft landing story is still in play and that the soft landing is probably the most likely scenario for um the U.S. economy and that tomorrow's non farm payrolls report will probably show a soft landing. And this is just part of me um, that what I did for uh, the breakdown for NFPs is part of me trying to put the bad, the fun in fundamentals. Um, and in the next six months, we'll probably see a more significant 
reduction inflation, along with, um, you know, no rate cuts in the Q4, but we could very much be looking at and no rate cuts or rate hikes for the majority of central banks in Q4, but we could be looking forward to rate um, cuts in, these, in, in Q1, Q2, for the rest of the year. So all of this will be very, very important to pay attention to because stocks have been trading very well, but they're starting to you know, falter quite a bit. And these risks could keep it under pressure, which for us as currency traders, or for me as a currency trader, means that risk off trades um, will perform probably perform better. So in the month of October specifically, there's a couple of things to watch out for. So October is traditionally one of the um, most volatile months of the quarter. And you can see that here. This shows you um, the standard deviation of you know, uh, the, the Dow month by month since 1986. And October is hands down the most um, volatile month. So what does that mean for you, for me as a trader? Because I always like to say I'm a trader first and an analyst second. What that means is a couple of things. You know, first off, um, you should definitely be using stops because um, at any point in time, um, we could see really big moves in the markets. When I talk about really big moves in the markets, October, and some of you may, and maybe Foster talks to you about this, is that some of you may know the term October phobia. And, you know, the phobia in some ways is really is very real because October has been the month where we have had the biggest market crashes like Black Tuesday, Black Thursday. <coughs> Sorry about that. I'm nursing a cold. So you'll work with me. Black Tuesday, Black Thursday, Black Monday in 1928, 87. These are the days when we, when we saw the Dow lose hundreds to thousands of pips in one day, so points in one day. And um, so the most important thing is to make sure you use a stop for those long trades. And um, because, you know, it, you suddenly, you know, regardless whether you're in currencies or you're in stocks, you could see a very sharp, abrupt move. Um, in equities as well as currencies. It's much more important to use stops and be vigilant on those long trades. Now, of course, you always want to use stops, right? And But for the short trades, you um, probably want to overweight the short trades, overweight the risky currency bets, and let them ride for longer than the um, long bets. Meaning that if you're long the market, long currencies, long stocks, take get in and out. Take those profits quickly because um, the seasonality is not on your side. If you're short, be more fluid. Let it go more. Uh, use your trailing stops so you can capture more of the markets. This is how you translate volatility and opportunity. And this is what I talk to our members about every single day. This is how we bring the fun in fundamentals. So the risk for um, the sec next six months include things like more banking sector weakness. You know, commercial property losses are growing. And a lot of banks are facing significant commercial property losses. And this is a big problem because um, I think that you're going to see more defaults, more mispayments as mortgage rates um, continue to rise because, you know, the lure of adjustable rate mortgages is just too much. But what you're also going to see is you're going to see more movement out of stocks into bank, into cash or into, um, into um, you know, bonds. Because when you have, you know, 5% 10-year yields and you have APRs and a lot of bank accounts now back at 5% and more, um, investors and Americans and people in general will start to see the allure of rising interest rates versus the risk premium in stocks. And you're going to see them move out of stocks and diversify more into, into cash or into CDs and other interest-bearing instruments. And that's going to hurt um, stocks, of course. And then you're also going to see um, uh, another big risk is, of course, consumer spending. We talked about that already. And we talked about how um, consumer spending is going to be affected by um, the student loan payments, rising energy costs, along with um, the, the uh, strikes and the labor market and the economy, global economy in general softening. So what does this mean in terms of trends for the dollar, for Forex, for gold? Well, I mean, you can see here we had a very fantastic dollar rally from 2021, sorry, from um, pretty much 2021 all the way up to 2023. And the dollar index then nosedived. But since the summer, 
we've seen a very strong U.S. dollar rally. And it's beginning, it's showing a little bit of signs of um, beginning to lose strength. And, you know, what I've been telling our BK Trader members is that um, the dollar is going to peak when yields peak. And we saw um, a pullback, in, a quite a, quite a material pullback in yields um, on third on Tuesday, yeah, um, when we had the ADP and service sector ISM numbers, we saw a pretty significant pullback in yields. And um, since then, yields, um, for the most part, has still remained um, depressed. And um, if we get a peak in yields, that's going to mark the top in the US dollar. So we're beginning to see that and whether or not that remains a peak will in large part be determined by tomorrow's non-farm payrolls report. In the near term, though, um, October is a great month for the euro. One, usually, I think we had um, only, on average, October is the, sorry, uh, yeah, October is a, a bad month for the euro. On average, October is the worst performing month for the euro dollar. So you have the worst performing month being February, then September, then October. And so, you know, that is um, something that is important to pay attention to because you have that consistency also in dollar yen, where October tends to be the um, a very good month for dollar yen, where the dollar has it's also the third best month for dollar yen. Now, of course, dollar yen has gotten very overbought and the suspected Bank of Japan intervention is causing a lot of two way action. But um, on a seasonality basis, it is definitely something that is um, leaning towards dollar strength for versus not, especially if we do get a continued meltdown in U.S. equities. So the dollar risks are material deterioration in U.S. spending and labor market data. That is going to mark the top in the dollar. If we see a quicker decline in inflation and we and oil prices have um, moved quite a bit in the past um, couple of weeks or even a week, we were up at $90 um, at one point. And um, we are now um, back at $83 um, uh, for, for crude oil. And so, you know, all of that is very, very important. And I think, you know, is going to, um, to suggest that we could see a quicker decline in, um, in uh, prices. And if that's the case, that could deter the Federal Reserve from delivering another rate hike. And then the Chinese real estate shock is a major risk for carry trades which are basically high risk currency trades in general, like yet the yen pairs and so forth. We're watching all of that closely because if this meltdown continues, it's going to hurt those um, instruments a lot. So what does this mean for gold? Well, gold has been um, in a very strong down. First of all, it was consolidated for a very long period of time for months from pretty much mid March all the way to September, end of September, Gold have been consolidating in a triangle downside downward triangle wedge. Then it broke down to the downside and continues to move lower. Now you may say, okay, you know, it's moved down quite a bit already. Um, how much further can it go? And I will share with you some tricks on how to determine how much further gold will go in just a second. But before that, I want to talk about the three ingredients in a perfect trade. The three ingredients in a perfect trade are basically fundamentals, technicals, and sentiment. I don't care what any of you say, but fundamentals matter. Fundamentals determine the big overall trend in, um, in the markets. They determine where the dollar is going, not for a day or a week, but for months at a time. And that is why um, I spend so much time talking about fundamentals because fundamentals really matter. And it's really important to understand that and to talk about that every day because it affects how things move in the short term and long term basis. And for me, fundamentals are part of every trade I take. For example, clearly today was a risk off day with stock futures selling off. And clearly we talked about all the risks in the global economy. And that um, drove me to short um, the dollar Swiss, dollar yen. Also, this morning, for example, we had good German trade data. So I actually went long euros this morning um, because fundamentals matter. The second ingredient to a perfect trade is, of course, technicals. You know, fundamentals, tell, in my opinion, tell you what should be, you should be trading. Technicals tell you when, whether or not you should get in and when you should get in. And then sentiment um, ensures that you have the momentum in the market to carry the trade in your direction, in your favor. So those, I think that those are very, very important to remember because fundamentals, technical, and sentiment are crucial elements to um, every trade. 
So what moves gold? What moves Forex? Well, we've got to take a top-down approach. What moves gold in Forex is basically the big stories like rate hikes, global growth, the banking crisis, um, inflation. Those are the things, the big stories that move um, Forex and gold in big ways. And um, in order to determine what those big stories are, we basically look at the three M's, macro, micro, and monetary policy. Macro are those big stories, which is you know, do we have a banking crisis? Do we have an um, implosion in the Chinese property market? Do we have um, student loan payments being due again? Do we have strikes? Do we have geopolitical risk? Do we have natural disaster? Those things are macro. Micro is day-to-day -day economic data. And micro determines, you know, what kind of trading opportunities you have on a day, more on a day trading basis or at most a week. Like, for example, we I leveraged the week ISM ADP report from when it was released, you know, all the way until, um, you know, tomorrow, non farm payrolls. But it doesn't necessarily carry over to the following week. Then there's monetary policy, which is almost as impactful as macro, because, you know, interest is nothing more important to the direction of currencies than where interest rates are headed. So it's extraordinary. So monetary policy is extraordinarily important. And for, you know, our BK trader members, I'm always talking about putting yourself into the shoes of the central bank, putting yourself into um, Jay Powell's head, thinking the way he thinks, looking at the way he what he looks at to get a leg up and determining where monetary policy go, will go. And it's not rocket science. I mean, he right, we know that he looks at jobs and inflation. That is why tomorrow's jobs report is so important. And so, you know, we always look at economic data and we always, you know, use that to lead us into whether or not um, we want to um, get into, you know, a trade ahead of a rate decision or whether how much we can ride it afterwards. Now, when it comes to trading, 95% of traders don't know what to trade, how to trade, and most importantly, how to keep the profits when they're made, how to keep it. So, let me share with you my trading tactics and how I trade just briefly. Um, I basically start trade twice a day. Um, I trade at 6.30 a.m. I trade the New York Open at 6.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. New York time. And I trade the Asia Open at 8 p.m. New York time. And usually my day trades happen during the, the 6.30 to 8 a.m. block. Um, sometimes I have some day trading opportunities at the Asia Open, but oftentimes Asia is where I put on more of my swing trades, the trades that carry over um, to the next day or so. Whenever I put on my trades, I always check fundamentals. And I always, you know, look for my trading setup and I always look for moving average clearance. And when it comes to trading the New York session, um, I basically um, have broken down the New York session into five distinct segments. The early New York session, the news trading session, the U.S. stock market open, London open, New York close. Each of these, and this is my, my tip for you for the New York session, the trick is that each of these sessions have a different personality and characteristic for those of you that are currency traders. In some ways, it carries over to gold and stocks as well, but more for my currency traders because that's my focus. In early New York, what happens then is that you have the momentum trend trace carrying over from what was happening in Europe. This is my most one of my most successful times for trading because what I like to do is I like to look at what happened overnight um, and, ride, and ride that move into the early New York open because the whole premise is that New York traders are coming into desk. They're checking to see, you know, what was the data released? They're checking to see what were the levels broken. And then they're riding those moves. And we're jumping in right before that. So usually I um, will, will take trend trades um, and jump in right before, right at the early New York open in my trend and momentum trades. Then at 8.30, 10 a.m., that's the news trades where you know, almost all the U.S. data is released between 8.30 and 10 a.m. So we're keying off U.S. data, you know, either riding the move on off the data or you know, trading in, in anticipation of it. Then there's the New York um, equity market open at 9.30. That's why my colleague Boris, um, Boris comes in and he live trades the New York session with our members. But the U.S. stock market open um, for currencies, what that means is that usually at the open, you get a burst of movement and then a retracement. Usually with my trades, I'm done by then. We may leverage on the initial burst of uh, movements because usually, like let's say, if Dow futures are down like 
400 points, you know that right at the open, it's going to go down 600 points before it snaps back up. And so sometimes it will leverage an initial continuation move lower, but you need to be out quickly. Um, and then there's a the London close. For those of you that are my Forex traders, the most important thing to know about the London close is often new highs, new lows are set right before the London close. And do not be fooled by them because they are often um, the top or the bottom. Because, you know, what ends up happening is those um, new highs, new lows for that session may be set. And then London traders are squaring up the books um, for the end of the day. And that is the most opportune time for reversals. So the London close is when you get to see reversals the most often. And so if you get a new high, new low set, don't jump on it thinking, wow, well, no, we broke to new highs. Let's get in on it. Bad idea. Chances are it's going to um, reverse. And then there's a London close, New York close, which really doesn't have too much opportunity unless you had a um, Federal Reserve monetary policy announcement or you had a really big move. Because remember, I don't know if some of you remember, but there were the days where we would have huge moves in the last hour of trade. And sometimes those moves will carry into currencies, but you know, only when we have big moves. I love trading New York because of the participation, the continuation, the big moves and the big direction. I also love trading Asia. And Asia also has two unique personality and characteristics. And the two parts of the Asia, I mean, there's like multiple parts, but the two main parts of the Asia trade are the, is the Asia open. And a lot of people say, you know, don't trade Asia. It's the dead of the market. It's the worst time to trade. And they're absolutely right if you're talking about, you know, 5 p.m. New York to 8 p.m. New York or 4 p.m. New York to 8 p.m. New York. Yeah, nothing's happening then. And it's, you know, fake outs will be, breakouts will be fake outs and you'll be caught in a grind. But a lot can happen at the Asia Open at 8 p.m. And, you know, yesterday um, we sold dollar yen, we sold euro yen, we sold, you know, we, we got into long dollar cad. There's a lot of trades that hit targets within like, 30 minutes, right at eight o'clock. And um, it's because like the US, Asia traders are coming in. They're looking to see what happened overnight. And they're looking to ride those moves. And that can be your opportunity. So I love to trade the Asia Open because it has the same kind of continuation momentum characteristics that I get at the New York Open. Asia Open is also a really great time to lay on swing trades. Um, it's usually the spreads have narrowed, the dust has settled, and your daily charts have closed, and it's a really good time to lay on swing trades. And then there's the European Open. Um, the European Open is uh, between 2 to 3 a.m. Now, of course, you know, Renee's asking, do I sleep? Yes, I sleep. I do not trade the European Open. I trade just the Asia Open and the New York Open. But there are also plenty of opportunities for those of you that do are around or night owls that trade the Asia Open. Um, there's also quite a bit of nice continuation trades um, between 2 to 5 a.m. New York time. And, um, and especially since there's a lot of data that's released um, around 3 a.m. New York time, um, that can trigger a lot of opportunity. If, like, let's say, like, um, we had a, um, a strong German trade data this morning, and that could have triggered, you know, an opportunity in your dollar um, to the upside off of the report. So what is my process? Every day when I start trading, my first step is I look at what are stocks doing? And what stocks doing are extremely important for currency traders and gold traders. Because look at this chart. This chart <clears throat> shows you the relationship between Aussie yen, which is the candlesticks, and the S&P, which is the orange line. And you can see here pretty much mirror images of each other, right? Where Aussie M, and it's always currencies taking their cue from equities, not the other way around. Equities do not take their cue from Aussie M, trust me. Um, you can see in this relationship that, you know, there's a very close relationship between Aussie M and um, S&P. So if I start my day and I see that stock futures, like today, let's say, is down a hard point, no way am I going to be buying Aussie yen or the yen crosses. I'm going to be looking for opportunities to sell. So if my trading strategy or your trading strategy is telling you to buy Aussie yen, I will pass on it on a day stock futures are down 100 points. If um, stock futures are down 100 points and I get a sell signal and I have a reason to sell Aussie yen, I'm going to be jumping all over it because 
the movement in stocks is consistent with my technical trading signal, meaning the sentiment in the markets, the fundamentals is consistent. You also see this relationship in the euro dollar and um, stocks. The euro dollar is a candlestick. The line is stocks. And also, we have a strong relationship between um, euro dollar and stocks. If you can't see my screen, just refresh. It seems to be the solution that everyone has. Um, so you see a very strong relationship. So same story, because euro is what we call a risk currency. Um, so if it's a risk currency and uh, stocks are selling off, I'm going to le be leaning towards the opportunity to sell your dollar then buy your dollar unless I have a good reason like good data and this is also important for gold you can see here we've got gold being the candlestick and the line being the stocks and you can also see that there's a very strong relationship between gold and stocks so you know stock futures are down stocks period are down a lot today and gold is down as well people say you know um gold is so supposed to be the safe haven bet but you can see from this chart yourself that that is not true um, it doesn't benefit or necessarily rally when um, stocks are um, are moving in the opposite direction. It doesn't rally when stocks are falling. Um, and you see there's much more of a positive relationship than there is a negative relationship between these two instruments. Then after I look at how stocks are doing, I will look at how are yields doing. This is for currency traders, even for gold traders. This is single-handedly the most important thing that you should be looking at every day. How are US yields doing? Because take a look at this chart. This chart shows you the relationship between 10 year treasury yield, which is the orange line and um, dollar yen, which is the candlestick. And you can see there's a very, very strong positive relationship between um, dollar yen and, um, and uh, yields. And this is why Dollar yen is down today. This is why shorting dollar yen was the right trade today. This is why I sold dollar Swiss, why I sold dollar yen today. This is why I sold dollar yen, dollar Swiss last night, because um, yields showed signs of peaking. And the pullback in yield, yields is an easy, um, uh, easy directional indicator of where dollar yen, the dollar in general, is going to go. So if you're trading currencies, trading dollar yen, you must be, need to be watching U.S. yields. And let's get this straight again. It is dollar yen that follows U.S. yields and not the reverse. U.S. yields does not follow dollar yen. The bond market is, is not watching what dollar yen is doing. Um, it is dollar yen that's tracking the movement in yields. Same thing with your dollar. Um, but this is obviously the opposite relationship where um, when yields, U.S. yields are rising, your dollar is falling. Because if you think about it, euro is euro slash U.S. dollar, right? So if the dollar component of the trade and U.S. yields are falling, then euro dollar should be rising. This is one of the reasons why I went long euro dollars this morning as well, because U.S. yields were falling. We had good German trade data. I felt like the dollar was going to pull back some more. And so, you know, we at you know, BK Traders went long euro dollar because we fused fundamentals with technicals and, you know, our trading indicator. And then gold. Gold also behaves like your dollar. It has a um, negative relationship, meaning that when yields, which is the orange line, rise, it's negative for gold. Why? Because gold, and the most important thing you should know about gold is that gold is priced in US dollars. So when the US dollar is falling, that tends to be good for gold. And when the US dollar is rising, it tends to be bad for gold. But what's much more important to that relationship is yields just like to and yields are a very very important driver of where gold is going to be headed so in a nutshell look for trades only in the direction of yields and stocks that's what i do that's why i implore encourage you to do as well and for those of you that are trading gold it's very important to watch how the us dollar is performing because this chart shows you the net the relationship between gold prices and the dollar index where the orange line is the dollar index and the candlesticks are gold and you can see they're basically completely opposite when dollar index rises gold falls so today we actually have a very interesting development where um gold is falling but 
the dollar is falling as well. And I believe that this could potentially um, be a buying opportunity in gold if um, that this we could be near a bottom in gold because I mean, all of it, you know, hinges on tomorrow's non-farm payrolls report. But if um, the dollar has peaked, then and U.S. yields have peaked and U.S. yields are down today, then we could have finally have a, a bottom in gold. So make sure you always watch sentiment because sentiment, you want sentiment to be on your side for every trade. And also make sure you go to my YouTube channel. I have a lot more tips on how to use fundamentals to trade because, you know, fundamentals are very, very important. The fourth step of my trading process is to always check, um, you know, the overall, aside from checking what the market sentiment is, which is looking at, you know, the stocks, the bond yields. Um, I also look at, you know, what's the bigger picture. And for our VK members, you know, I put out a fundamental heat map every week where I express my views on whether, you know, you should be bullish or bearish certain major currency pairs, and you can even sort by currency pairs. If you click on any of these tables, you get a more um, detailed breakdown of why I feel that way. And so we always apply the fundamental picture into the trades that we select. Then I will check the charts. I will check the charts. Then and only then I'll check the charts for, um, for, the, for my trading setup. And, you know, I love to trade with the trend and I particularly love to trade with moving averages. And, you know, there's nothing and just a very, very simple strategy that I want to share with you guys that you can apply um, for trading gold in particular. And this is a long term strategy is that, you know, gold is, you know, can be a very trending instrument. And if you simply put on the 10 period SMA and the 20 period SMA on a four hour chart, one simple way that you can um, follow the trend in gold and trade gold is to buy when you have a moving average crossover, where you have the 20 period moving above the 50 period SMA. This is the beginning of a uptrend. And you, you, if you went long here, you have a really nice uptrend in gold. Here, if you sold here, it was beginning a very nice downtrend in gold. Here, another very beautiful uptrend in gold. This one maybe was stopped out, but it came back down. And eventually worked out here um, for our charts. You can see winner. This one didn't work out, but loser, winner, 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 winner. I mean, these are the odds that you want, like four out of five, four out of five winners. And you can apply the same concept, very simple for our charts in your dollar, you know, and sometimes you might get caught up in a short move. But that's what stops so far. And but when you get a long move, you can get a very, very generous move lower. And that's why it's important to use um, what I call T1, T2, target one exit, target two exit, multiple exits, so that you can, um, when it moves in your favor, you can push the trade further so you can benefit from it more. So here, you showed it here, 109.40, and it went all the way down as well, 107.60. Here it was a very short move. Here it was another very long move. Here's another very long move in the euro dollar. Uh, even dollar yen. This one um, would have been stopped out, but that's okay. This one became a beautiful winner. One winner, two winner, three winners, four winners here. So and this has become a very, you could have milked this trade a lot if you trailed by the 50 SMA, for example, on the four hour chart. So that's one very simple way that you can look at trading gold and currencies on a four hour basis. I personally use what I call my zip indicator, which is an indicator that I've been using for years and we developed for our members. It's a members only indicator. It is designed to be simple to understand. It helps you identify trades quickly and it prevents impulsiveness. And it's very easy to use. It works on one hour charts. So you want to pull up the one hour charts. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that I will oftentimes share you know, these zip charts. So you use it on one hour charts. Um, the rule of thumb is that it, there's a lot of complicated math that goes into it, but the way it's displayed to you is that the background color reflects the longer term trend where the instrument is trading in relation to indicator line reflects the shorter term trend. So when the background is green, that means that the longer trend is positive. When the background is red, that means the shorter trend is positive. And when we get um, the currency pair trading ab in, above the indicator line and in the green zone. That means the longer term trend and the shorter term trend is positive. That's when you want to be looking to buy. When it's trading in the red zone and below the indicator line, 
that is when you want to sell because it means that the longer term trend and the shorter term trend is negative. But of course, you want we need to add in the market sentiment element as well as the fundamental element. We don't take trades blindly. So then you wait for the white candle. So zip will tell you um, zip buy signal right here. So it'll show you zip buy signal. And you can see in here, you go long beginning of a very nice uptrend. But you have to make sure that it is also within our trading hours because knowing when to trade and when not to trade is extraordinarily important because you have to, with any strategy that you're taught, you have to recognize what is the, um, what is the strategy based on? What type of market conditions work best for strategy and what type of market conditions work worse? And for Zip, for example, and as I've laid out the whole story to you, it is a momentum trend-based strategy. Um, which requires participation and in order for it to work out. And that is why I trade the market opens. I trade the New York open and the US and the Asia open because that's when we have the participation. That's when um, the trades, that's how we filter out the bad signals, the weak trades, the false signals. So we make sure if it's within our trading hours. If it is, then I take the trade and I you know, uh, milk it for what it's worth. This is what a long trade looks like. And this is what a short trade looks like. And the best times to trade the strategy is during the early New York Open, the Asia Open, and the London Open. That's when you have the strongest momentums um, in the market. That's when you get the most beautiful um, trading opportunities. There's also other variations like early zip, like when you know we have the currency pair dropping below the indicator line. And the background is so short term trend short turns negative and the longer term trend turns negative one candle later. So that can be an equally powerful signal. It just happens a little later later. And you see that in the Aussie dollar here. And then, you know, dollar CAD, we have different um, setups here. This one was a, a zip variation. This one you wouldn't have taken because it was at 10 a.m. outside our trading time frame, which is why the trading time frame is so important. And then you have this. Um, other setup right over here as well. And then what I love the most is when we have double zip and triple zip, where we have more than one zip um, indicator, where we have multiple zip, zip trading signals um, forming. That's when the setup is the most powerful. And um, you can see that over here. And you can also um, see that over here as well. So I just want to show you quickly what this looks like on um a real on real time charts um because i want you to see that it's not just um past um charts like this is the real time dollar cad chart and you can see we had a beautiful zip buy signal happening here um this morning we had a beautiful zip sell signal happening here um in euro pound as well you know, we sold dollar yen um, because it was below in the sell zone. Stock futures were lower. Yields were lower as well. Euro dollar um, was in the buy zone when I came online. So we went long euro dollar after the good trade number. So lots of different opportunities here. Um, and, you know, there, these opportunities are, you know, happening throughout um, the course of the day. And there's, you know, lots of different setups. And, you know, Zip has done extraordinarily well. I mean, these are our results since the beginning of January 2022. In the last 12 months alone, 3,500 pips. But I want to make this clear. When I trade, we target 100 pips a week, which sounds modest to a lot of people. But 100 pips a week adds up. 100 pips a week adds up to um, three to 400 pips a, um, a month to 3,000 to 4,000 pips a year. And you can see that in, um, you know, this week, I don't trade um, non-farm payrolls Friday. So we're done with trading this week. And you can see, I just recapped, we traded three days, 133 pips, and we hit our target. And that's the way, you know, we trade. And that's how we make, you know, such consistency. 15 out of 17 winning weeks, 88% positive weeks, 24 out of 28 winning months with steady results and low drawdown. And that's, you know, the way I trade. And that's how I make sure we know what to trade, how to trade and how to keep keep our profits. And we also do it with um, a proprietary indicator, a proprietary money management tool that we have called Profit Shield Pro. And a lot of our members 
use Profit Shield Pro for my trades, for Boris's trades. And what it does is it, uh, it's just a tool. It helps you automatically calculate position size. So let's say you want to risk, you know that you want to um, risk trade only $5,000 worth of dollar yen and gold. So you put that amount in and it will automatically tell you what the position size will be. It'll preset the stops and limits. So if you know that we're putting 40 target, 40 stop on your stops and limits, it'll automatically attach them to every trade. Or if you have multiple exits and multiple, multiple exits, it will also automatically put those in. And it will dynamically react to market movements with adjustable trailing stops and targets that you can set. Um, it can have a one-click kill switch. Let's, let's say you know we know that um, if you're trading and you're trading Canadian and you're trading um, ahead of non-farm payrolls, you got a bunch of positions on 8:25. You want to be out of everything. One-click kill switch on Profit Shield Pro. So with that, I invite you all to check out um, our website bktraders.com. Um, you know, we've got a lot of stuff there. You can also check out our YouTube channel, which, um, you know, you can get, learn a lot more about trading um, fundamentals and Forex. And the main takeaway is that you want fundamentals, technicals, and sentiment to be on your side for every single trade. That's when you get the most powerful trades. And for those of you that um, are joining me today, I want to give you a very special offer. If you want to learn how to trade with me, trade with me. Um, it's our um, BK Traders Beginner Pack. You can click on, you go to bktraders.com, click on Beginner Pack, and you can see all the details where you get my trading signals, my zip indicator, our chat, um, lots of our live stream that I was talking about where we set up, I set up our traders every single day um, for a very, very nice discounted price. Check it out at bktraders.com on the beginner pack tab. All right. So with that, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that um, you guys may have on anything that we talked about. And I hope you enjoyed today's class. I see some questions from earlier. Um, what will happen if... The sun stopped love. I'm sorry, I don't even know what you're saying, Salman. Sun stopped loving the moon and taller cad. Um, for our target, just break below support in dollar yen. Yeah, it did. Which feed is the most accurate forecast for data? I would say um, dailyfx.com is the most comprehensive. Um, where do you see crude oil after 2030? I have no idea. I mean, anything can happen in the next seven years, right? I'm not going to project what's going to happen in seven years. It's a very, very long time from now. Anyone who tells you that they can predict what could happen in seven years is just lying to you. Um, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Do you trade clients or your own money? Um, right now, it's just you know, our own capital. We teach people how to trade, and we invite people to join our trading room and get our strategies and indicators. Any other questions? What is my best indicator for breakouts in the five minute chart for EuroCAD? I do not trade five minute charts. I trade one hour charts, daily charts, four hour charts. My Boris trades one minute charts and five minute charts. Um, and maybe, you know, one day we'll have, Fausto will have Boris on. He can enlighten you with his day trading <laughs> strategies. What should I do to become a professional trader? Should I get a degree in finance and economics? No, watch YouTube videos. I mean, it's great. Or take one of my courses, uh, which is, a, is basically distills all the most important things that you should know. Um, you know, check out bktraders.com. What size trades do you recommend in dollar amounts? I mean, it really depends on your own risk capital. Um, you know, 10, 5, 10,000 is, you know, depending on, it's really hard to say. It depends how much you have to trade with. Can you define pips? Yeah, it's basically points. Um, points in percent and uh, what pips stand for and it's the word for forex how do we trade major u.s data you know i've got videos on youtube at um, our youtube channel for youtube forward slash bk forex how to trade news which um you can definitely check out just search our youtube channel how many hours a day do i spend trading i spend maybe i trade maybe two hours a day in the morning and two hours a day in asia yeah, The Economist is great. Bloomberg.com is great. WallStreetJournal.com is great. Um, I also do on Twitter a um, daily video 
that um, you guys could follow my Twitter handle, Kathy Lean FX. I do a daily video with a snippet on the main story for the market that day. That may help as well. All right. Any other questions? I'm impressed that I didn't cough once during this whole webinar. <laughs> it's all the well, lozenges well, and tea and everything. You did well, Kathy. Well, anyway, thanks for having us, Kathy. So it was nice having you here and um, look forward to having you. And we're going to have Lunar Song next, too. So, uh, you know, like I said, everyone take advantage of her promotion there and uh, listen, try the cheapest trade you can make, like we always say. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Fasto. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining me today. Um, I'll talk to you all soon. Have a great day in the markets. Bye, Kathy. And in the meantime, everyone, we're going to be picking up right where she left off. I'm going to talk about some stocks and day trading, too. So remember, this is a two-part event. So as she's done, you know, you'll be able to do our event right after. We're going to be able to pick up from there. So uh, let me just do a couple of things here. Hold on one second. There we go. All right. So uh, once again, like I said, just take her up on her offer. And uh, let me uh, just bring up my PowerPoint in the meantime, because I, I, we're going to just get right into it. Let me share my screen with my, uh, let me share my screen here. Hold on one second. All right, can everybody see my screen okay? 